So I guess I'm saying that success to me is not just achieving a worthy goal, but moving through the, the challenges, right? Doing mm-hmm. the hard things um, mm-hmm. and feeling worthy and trusting yourself. Mm-hmm. Like, um, I think success is trusting yourself. To That's do- powerful. Yeah. Hello, 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 and welcome to the Success Sessions. My name is Jesse Johnson, and I am super excited and like quite tender and like full in my heart of love to be here with my dear friend and like soul sister, Amira Alvarez. Amira, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm pretty freaking thrilled too. Amira and I have been like really like entrepreneur sisters. We've worked both with David Nagel. That's how we met, was studying alongside him in very deep confrontational programs. And so, and we've just, our, our missions are similar. We kind of have similar personalities. So we've been, I think one of the most special things about our relationship actually is that we have been an example both to each other, but I think also to the world of people who are kind of set up by society to be competitive, but instead just are like fucking back to back, shining as bright as we can, loving each other so much and really able to support each other better than almost anyone else because of all our similarities. So I'm really grateful to have you here, Amir. I love every minute I spend with you. Likewise. So Just to name it also, I want to bring in just a little bit of the professional bio piece, which is just that Amira is a fucking rock star. She works with female entrepreneurs and helps them make incredible money incredibly quickly. She's phenomenal at what she does. And I love her business theme name, like central idea, which is the unstoppable woman. And so I'm going to tell you right now, sign up for her podcast. She's doing brilliant, brilliant work there. And if you are a woman and you are an entrepreneur, you have your own business, really listen in, feel in, like lean in, because Amira has nectar for you. Excellent. Thank you. So Amira, how did you define success as a child and how were you wrong? It's such a good question, Jesse. I love this question. I love, love, love this question. And I've given it like this much thought because usually the best stuff comes out when I'm just riffing on it. But the thing that I did come to was that when, you know, I grew up in a very academic household. You know, my father was a professor. My mother was a lawyer. Like there were high standards, um, at least on my mother's side, they all went to Ivy League schools, right? And like, it was like, This is what, this is what you need to achieve, right? And on my father's side though, from quite serious poverty, he got himself out of the barrio and ended up being a professor at Yale and UCLA and being on this board and this board and, you know, accolades at the wazoo, right? And, you know, we were brought up with like a lot of exactingness and like what success was, was making a great argument at the dining room table, like being able to hold your freaking own and um, splice out the logic and not just the grades. The grades were like, that was like beyond expected. Like you just got them, right? Like, like that was like, what do you mean? Not, that, that wasn't a straight A, like what's going on here? But the dynamic in the household was for excellence. And um, I would say for years, I I felt like that was limiting or that I wasn't really seen because that was, you know, that's a very narrow part of your your beingness, your experience Mm -hmm. of being. Uh, And felt limited by it, even though both my parents, my father especially, was like, be whatever you want to be. Like, you don't want to go to college? Go pick breaks for the summer, right? Like, I mean, there was a a little bit, there was a lot of joie de vivre also, but there was a, a, 
high demand for excellence. And there was never like talk about where you learn the not good enough. Right? It was never good enough. Like there was mm -hmm. always a better, like, mm -hmm. even if you knocked it out of the friggin' park, there was always a, why didn't you do this? Or what about that? And, and now looking back, I see how that's really served me. This is after a huge amount of, you know, personal growth work right? and, and reworking the story and everything. Right. Cause I, I had some resentment about it, mm -hmm. but it, but it did, um, it, it, it did drive a certain level of excellence where, where I can see interacting with other people that their the quality of their work or, or how they show up in the world is, is less precise or less, um, they have a, a lower standard and it's um, apparent and it doesn't serve them in certain areas, especially in business, not in every area. But like, if you want to be able to present a great presentation to someone, right? Like it, it serves you to be able to like put full sentences together and think five, five <laughs> steps and all this stuff. Yes. So that's one way. And then I think uh, as part of that childhood piece, um, part of success, this is really interesting, this just dropped in for me, um, was pleasing my parents, okay? Mm -hmm. And in different ways. So, so father was kind of exacting standards, right? Like academic and, you know, I tell this story sometimes to, to explain it like being a little kid, being probably six or seven, and uh, having been shown how to clean the windshield of a car, um, and finally getting the opportunity to do it myself, right? Like my father said, okay, it's your turn, you do it yourself. And I'm like, I'm, I'm a little thing right now, you know, like even as a full-size yes. adult, okay? So imagine me six or seven, I am teeny tiny, okay? <laughs> reaching up and I'm so proud of myself. I'm cleaning the, the windshield with the squeegee and I'm wiping down the blade with the paper towel so that it doesn't drip and I wipe up all the little excess and I'm so freaking proud of myself, right? And I can barely reach the freaking window, okay? <laughs> and I get in the car and I'm sitting there, I'm so proud. And my father gets in and looks at the windshield and he's like, that's too work, Amira. And I, freaking lost it right mm. you know like totally crushed mm. and what's interesting is I shared that story with my father recently and he's like oh yeah that makes sense I would have said something like that zero zero like contrition you know like he's like that was that was good parenting you did a crappy job why would I like <laughs> <laughs> and, and my adult self goes yeah why would you lie to a kid. I mean, maybe you could have framed it a little bit better. That might have yeah. been you know, sensitive to the age. Um, but I think it has informed how I actually coach with people because I'm a truth teller. And I, 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 don't, I don't think it serves people to bullshit them, quite frankly. And so, so now I can see how that up, upbringing would, mm -hmm. has led to a level of... Um, I, you know, I think I put a little bit more tenderness into it than that, but has led to some of my skill set about really zeroing in on, um, on the truth. Circling back, I was going to talk about my mom and, uh, you know, I love her dearly and nothing was ever good enough for her from a different perspective. She really wanted, um, not consciously by any means, but her kids to fill that void inside mm -hmm. uh, of, for love, for being good enough, worthiness, all of that stuff. And, um, you know, I, I think she would, I, I've never actually had that conversation with her, but there was, there was always a moving of the goalpost around that because that was an endless, that was an endless void. There was nothing, right. there was no there there. You, there it was, you couldn't fill it. So I never felt successful, but as a little girl, all you want to do is make mommy happy. Like, mm. like you want that, that person you love so very, very much to be happy. Mm. And so I learned persistence 
and mm -hmm. drive and willpower and determination um, in a kind of back ass words way. But I, I did learn that. Now it's transmuted, right? Now mm -hmm. I don't have to be um, struggling for love, right? Right. Or, or to fill, I'm not doing it to fill someone else up, but I, but I think I could, I can very clearly see how I learned a lot of my determination and persistence uh, from that. I think it's really powerful. So I just want to put extra like emphasis, big neon lights around how each of the things that you're sharing, you're highlighting the misconception or the inaccuracy of your child thinking around this definition or this concept of success. But each time you're very powerfully also claiming it like, and here's how I use that now, or, and here's how that serves me now, or, and here's how that's still relevant now. It's just needed a little like tune up or a pivot in the perspective that I have or something like that. And I think that's the first time that anyone's done that here. Cool. So it's, yeah. it's very cool. It's not surprising to me at all. This is part of your wheelhouse skill set to own all of your experience in your whole life. Um, but I, I would actually love for you to talk about that from your perspective. Why do you do it? Why do you do that? Why, like, why not, why aren't you just saying like, you know, my dad was kind of a controlling asshole who was really judgmental and my mom was a narcissistic bitch who was constantly asking for the impossible. Fuck that. You know, like you're not doing that. Why not? Um, Oh, so many reasons, Jesse, because I did it for 40 fucking years. And <laughs> it's painful, okay? Mm. Like it, just, it doesn't serve after, after a while. Well, fundamentally, it's a victim mentality. And I don't want to be a victim. I want to be someone who actualizes what she wants in her life and, and is a clear creator of, of every outcome. I mean, we're all clear creators of every outcome that we experience, whether we're conscious of it or not. And I want to be a very conscious creator around that. And so I refuse to stay limited. And if I say they did this to me, they fucked my life up. I stay the victim and I stay limited. And so, uh, and quite frankly, it keeps me in a child's psychology and I am a full grown adult and I want to own myself, right? I don't want to be a six year old anymore or mm -hmm. a 14 year old who's throwing a fit or whatever it is, right? Like I want to be a full grown, fully owned woman in this mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, you have to, you have to own your past and move beyond the perspective of the child, okay? Mm -hmm. And it's not to discount the experience of the child. I did a, I've done a lot of work to release that, okay? Mm -hmm. But I, I no longer wanna be trapped by it. And I think that's true for a lot of people. They feel trapped by how we thought we had to please others growing up and it's and it's come with them into their lives and you and I both teach how to be successful in business and it's it's such a trap it keeps you from you know asking for a sale like fundamentally 101 right mm -hmm. um, it, caring like not if if I only cared what other people thought I wouldn't be able to tell my clients the truth mm -hmm. about where they're blocked and what they need to do because I would be afraid that their feelings would get hurt and then they wouldn't like me and then they wouldn't want to coach with me and then what about the payment and blah, 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 blah. And that's just not sustainable mm -hmm. in a coaching relationship whatsoever. And yet I, I know a lot of coaches do coaching light and that's the way and I just don't believe in it. It's just not. Yeah. Yeah, I love hearing you talk about this. You're so clear. Thank you. Oh, so I think there's more, there's more to talk about, but I think it'll be, it'll be even more fun through the lens of how you define success now. Like what's changed, especially given how much you're owning the, the, the truths of your childhood. How do you, how do you think about success now? Yeah, that's such a good one. So I went to Earl Nightingale's 
classic definition of success, you know, the progressive realization of a worthy ideal. And it's always like, I hear his deep voice on the recording and, and I'm like, oh, that's it. Thank you, Earl. Thank you for giving me the answer. Right. Um, and, and there's something, I mean, it's a really powerful way of defining success because it's progressive realization of a worthy ideal. It's, 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 it allows you to be successful along the way. Hmm. And, and it's a worthy ideal. It's like what you want. And so for me, I will say that I, the beginning of my business journey, success, I put a number to it. It was, you know, I'm, I'm not ashamed about that. A lot of people start with the impact goal, start with the big purpose, start with, and I was just like, I am so freaking done with under earning and not making enough money. And like, I am a hard worker. I'm super smart. I'm dedicated. I'm really good at what I'm doing. Why am I not making the money that I want? So success was really about like, here's my money goal. Let's reach it. And it wasn't at the expense of my ethics or integrity or anything like that, but I was going to do whatever it took to break through to get to that. And in doing so, I had, I had to achieve, I had to become someone I, I, I hadn't yet been. The essence of me was, but I hadn't yet stepped into being. Mm -hmm. And it was a metamorphosis. It was a birthing. It was breaking out of your shell and it was uh, painful and struggle and all of that. Right. I mean, it, there was a lot of, um, uh, just friggin' growth that had to happen. That was not for the faint of heart. Let me just tell you. Um, and Getting through those emotional, mental, psychological blocks to the point where I feel freaking free. Like I own my fucking life and I'm like, you could throw me down in a desert and I would know how to you know, start my business again, figure anything out. Like, mm -hmm. like I, I am, I, you know, there might be, I have challenges. I have challenges, right? There are business challenges, things come but I have so much confidence in how to create what I want, that, that methodology that, that you call it manifestation, but it's like, how do you achieve your goal? I know how to do that. That feels like success to me, okay? Mm. But moving through those challenges has made me feel worthy, which is, mm. I think, an interesting thing to put into the conversation, Jesse, because, um, Many people achieve things but never feel worthy. I don't know how to say that in a different way. Let me see if I can put the words to it. Um, I love what you're saying. There's something about when you do the hard thing, when you do the breakthrough and you don't stop, to use my language, right? Like my business is the unstoppable woman. Like when you don't stop, when you don't hit the wall and turn away or shrink or become smaller or say later or some other time, or I'll, I'll make my goal smaller, or I don't have to do that right now or whatever the, the alibi is, mm -hmm. you actually go, I understand that this is a fucking challenge and I'm going to do it. And it's painful while you're going through it. It, 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 it's maybe not physically painful, but it's, it's emotionally not pleasant. Mm -hmm. And you do it anyways, you get to the other side and you're like, wow, I am someone who does hard things. I am someone who did that. And that, that makes you feel mm. worthy. Mm. And it, it gives you self-trust, which is huge. So many, so many people don't have trust in themselves um, mm. because they've turned around, they've hit the wall and made that U-turn so many times that they don't have that trust in themselves. So I guess I'm saying that success to me is not just achieving a worthy goal, but moving through the, the challenges, right? Doing mm. the hard things um, mm. and feeling worthy and trusting yourself. Mm. Like, um, I think success is trusting yourself. To That's do powerful. Yeah. I just came to that. Thank you for asking the question. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just taking that in because I, first of all, I want to just emphasize that if you had not said everything that you said, if you just were like, success is trusting yourself, I don't think that anyone would actually understand what you mean, yeah. right? It's even though those words are, are very simple English words, anyone can understand them. The transmission of what you're talking about is so much deeper and, and everything that you said is what made it possible for me to really get it, grok it, like feel it in my body. So thank you for being willing to, to do all that in front of us and, and let us, because I think that that's, I think anyone that's listening to you now is going to be better prepared to move through whatever their next challenge is, because they've heard you say that. I think that anyone that is, thinking about their own definition of success can include this self-trust in a way that they wouldn't have had access to you because of what you did. Like, this is big. This is big. Thank you. Yes. I, something also just came to me, like we're talking about when you move through the challenges, it's hard. And so many people don't want life to be hard. Like there is a stance, like we think it's supposed to be easy. And yet it would be so vanilla hmm. without the challenge. Like we wouldn't, we wouldn't feel our greatness hmm. if we didn't have challenges. Like they're, they're there not to just mess with you. Okay. They're, the, they're, they're not there just to like sabotage your life and make you feel like crap, right? They're there for your growth, hmm. for you to, to, to grow, to become more, right? And, and see so, what we're capable of. Totally. To live our potential, right? Mm -hmm. to, right? And so if, if everything was just easy peasy lemon breezy right mm -hmm. which when you get to the other side it feels easy peasy lemon breezy like once you get then whatever you thought was so hard that's you've done it okay mm -hmm. but that moving through bit it's like if you can train yourself and i know you've done this i've done this too right if you can train yourself to love that challenge to transform what th that growth edge means Mm -hmm. like there's always tension in the growth right mm -hmm. and and you could say there's always more than just tension in the growth you know um but you know if you can really choose to embrace that i think that's also part of what success is and and just to put it in more of a like a crystallized version it's like managing your mindset mm -hmm. you know managing your mind managing your thinking being able to really mm -hmm. um, determine how you think, mm -hmm. what you let in from the outside world, what you make of it, um, how you filter everything, the meaning you create. When you have mastery over that, that's, that to me is huge success as well. You know, I, I want to go back to two things just to, refine the integration of them because they feel still really important. One of them is I, I, I am understanding also more deeply that it's not your old definition of success isn't really all that related to your new definition. You just are leveraging the mastery that you got from that time and that definition. Now, you, it, you didn't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Like you got something from that, you mined the experience and now you claimed it, but it doesn't really have any, you're not talking about people pleasing or other people's happiness or getting good grades in any of what you're talking about now. So I just want to like, that feels really significant that the threads of success from your childhood show up in new ways now, but they don't show up in the definition of success at all. I would agree. Yeah, I would definitely agree. And, and oh, go ahead. The only way I think you could weave it a little bit together in so much as what I said in the last point, and then what a point you made earlier, which is managing your mind, right? Having mastery over your mind and how you pointed out that I had taken 
what was um, painful experiences from my childhood and transform them into a meaning that really worked for me, mm. um, which is true. I, I have. So you did that. Okay. Um, <laughs> that, that those two things are synced in a little bit of, in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, uh, that was me like thinking it because the other piece that feels important to bring back is what you said about feeling worthy. And that to me stands out as the fundamental difference actually in the two definitions is that your childhood definition was based on the premise of proving your worth yeah, and kind of consistently not measuring up and, and like, I mean, I'm saying this now because this is my experience. I think this is most people's experience. This like American schooling does this to us, whether it tries to or not. It's part of our culture. I think we come by it honestly. So I don't want to throw anyone under the bus, parents or children, but it's such a common thing to just feel like we're not good enough. Yeah. You know, what's interesting. I'm sort of pondering this. Maybe you can help me splice it out a little bit because I think the difference is that when I was a child, I was trying to get my worthiness from doing things for other people, pleasing other people. Even though I thought it was pleasing myself, I was actually doing it to please others, right? Other mm -hmm. people's expectations. And now I'm still getting a sense of worthiness from achieving stuff. Like I'll set a goal and you know, whether it's running or um, something in my business or whatever it is, right? Like I, I'm a goal setter, like through and through, okay? Like you have to know where you're going, otherwise you'll never get there, right? Um, and so, I, but now I'm doing it for me. So like I do feel wholly worthy already. And I feel like, um, how do I say this? I know that every time I've broken through and gotten to the next level, it's not like I felt not worthy before and suddenly I feel worthy. Um, but when I get to the next level, I can feel a different level experience of worthiness. Um, what but is I, that? Okay, I, want, I want you to talk more about it. Like what, what changes? Say that again. What changes? So like I can, I can like six months ago, I'm going to make up a time frame. but six months ago, I would have had the same conversation with you that I'm having right now. Feel whole. I feel secure. I feel worthy. All of that. Yep. And I then do something in my life or business and I break through to the next level and I feel different. Hmm. And it's a new level of worthiness because I have, reached, I have expressed the fullness of who I am in a bigger, larger way. I've reached that much more of my potential. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, but what's driving me is not a sense of unworthiness anymore, mm -hmm. which it was when I was a child and really for most of my adult life. Okay. Mm -hmm was this sense of unworthiness drawing me and causing me to want to do more, right? And now it's because I, 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 and it's what I teach. I know it's what you teach as well. Like it's, I'm doing it because I want something. It like it's, it's des desires causative, like the desires pulling me forward versus the fear of being unworthy pushing me. Mm -hmm. And, um, mm -hmm. I still like have some urgency drivenness. Like I still have like, if my team needs something at a particular time, I'm like, Oh shit, I need to get that done. Yes. Right. Like there's still a, there's still a, um, I, I'm not laissez faire about my life or my business in any way, mm. but it it's so, and there's urgency there, but it's not that fear of not being good enough. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Well, and, and my experience, I'm assuming that this is also true for you. My experience of that transformation is that it feels much more, I feel much more nourished 
the process of moving through challenges feels nourishing. Yeah. Whereas as a kid, and I also like you, like through my adulthood, trying to prove myself, trying to prove my worth, trying to, you know, get other people to give me the stamp of approval. Um, that felt so constantly draining. Like, I think that a huge part of the anxiety and stress that people experience in such tremendous intensity at this time comes from the scarcity that's at the foundation of all of their efforts. It's like they're always running on empty. Yeah. And what you're describing is what it means to, like, drive a car that's full of gas. Yeah. You still want to get there, right? You still have a destination, but you're full. Yeah. Yeah. And you're, it's like excitement, right? The, people talk about fear and excitement being the yeah, same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? But one's with breath. And I think it's like, it's, it's like, it's something similar to that. It, it's, it's like, I'm still wanting to prove my, myself. That sounds wrong, but it's true. To yourself though. But to myself, not to others. Right. right? Um, what, when did that change, Amira? Oh, not too long ago, you know, I mean, in the last two, three years, like really not that, that, that long ago. And how did it change? We're building my business. It was the biggest, I mean, the classic saying biggest personal growth journey of my life up until now. But, um, yeah, you know, when I went like that first year and we were very parallel that I went from 138 to 700 K in one year and like five times my income. And I just was like, I'm just doing whatever my mentor tells me to do. And I'm just like going and it was like fucking rough road, but I did. Right. Uh -huh. and, um, then after that, I was like, okay, what, what the heck did I do? And what do I need to do next? And, oh, you know, this is a big piece of it, Jesse. Ask me questions about this because I don't exactly know how to pull it in, but maybe you as my friend can reflect. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I got a divorce, mm -hmm. right? I, I was wondering about that. Yeah, and, and I think that was a big part of no longer doing things for other people. Because, mm. you know, I was in a very well partnered, happy, um, non-contentious, not abusive, on the same side kind of marriage, but we had different ambitions and different desires. And um, I had a very much a growth mindset and wanted was money positive. And um, he was not, he, I mean, he enjoyed the money I was bringing in, but he wasn't um, wanting to create um, a bigger life and actually was still in scarcity around money. Mm -hmm. And um, so I bring that up because in that relationship, I made so many decisions for years based on not rocking the boat. Like, okay, we won't spend money in this way and we won't do this and we won't do that. And even while I was married in that that period where I started making a lot of money, I was like, we're getting the new windows put in and I'm getting new furniture over here. And like, we're getting wall sconces. And it was like, like he couldn't say no because I was making the money, but it was, was a disorienting experience. And I realized that that's just one, I mean, money is just such a beautiful, so concrete that you can really point to it. Mm -hmm. um, but it was just one way in which I was, compromising my truth hmm. to please someone else and not make someone else feel bad or insecure or um i wanted to win at that marriage in that relationship right hmm. and so and i was very loyal and dedicated and there wasn't like we did not break up for any sort of dramatic reason it was like a very um, conscious conversation between the two of us and all of that stuff um but I think that was a pivotal place for me in terms of like, I'm no longer doing it for someone else. Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, I, I, I appreciate, first of all, I, I appreciate you being willing to share with us about that. And I, I think you're, I know you're comfortable with that, but I, I still, it's very personal. And I think it's that kind of thing that people actually need to hear because I, frankly, I think that that comes up for everyone. Not that everyone gets divorced when they start to do this work around money, but there is, there is material that comes up specifically in our most intimate relationships that most of us do not want to look at or deal with. And if we don't, we will never break through. And it's not because of that person. It's because, because of, that. of who we show up as with that person. But if we're not willing to, we can't change who we show up as if we're not willing to risk losing the relationship. And most people are not willing to risk it. And Even if it means sacrificing their life purpose. It's so scary. It's so scary. And it's a fundamental fear, fear of loss of love, which is linked to um, not having security in this world. Right, yeah. right. Um, but, you know, so many women talk to me, and it's very clear that they're in relationships that are not allowing them to thrive. Mm -hmm. But there's all sorts of alibis and stories around why they why they can't do something and i am not i would like to just say for the record i'm not an advocate of divorce i'm not like i don't talk to women and say get a divorce right like i'm pro love i'm pro relationships i'm pro men i'm pro women like all of that okay yes um and but but i guess what i'm saying is like that's a big fear for women just as you pointed out like just they're afraid of success because they think that it's going to destroy their relationship and what's going to destroy their, their life is not fully actualizing who they are. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I will just say that like for those women who are listening and can relate to my story, I'm having a freaking amazing life and it's better on the other side, you know? <laughs> like, yes. Um, yes. but, and, and I don't want to make light of it. Like there was, there was grieving, there was working through, mm -hmm. you know, like divorce is divorce, but yeah, I, 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 I pat myself on the back. I, I think I handled it fairly well, but it was still, you know, a very intense experience, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, I mean, think about this idea of doing things for other people, Jesse. I remember when I told my mother I was getting a divorce and she was mad madly in love with Jack. Jack is, I mean, you know, Jack, Jack is easy, easy to love. Yeah. yeah. He's a good guy. Right. Uh, I'm super happy that I was married to him for 14 years, you know? Yeah. Um, and she was like freaking crushed. Right. Mm -hmm. And I had to like, um, take care of her because her, her and I didn't spend that much time on it because that's not the relationship that we have. Um, but like the, it was a playing out of that childhood thing of like, I'm hurt. I'm at a loss. You need to fill that void. And actually mom, this isn't about your life. Like, right. You know, like, yeah. Um, and I don't mean to sound insensitive, but there was something in there about like, um, I was no longer, married to the guy and living out some vision of the perfect married life for my mother to, to make her feel good. And I didn't even realize that I was doing that. So uh -huh. like, uh -huh. you know, till yep. that moment where I told her I was getting a divorce and made this statement. And I was like, Oh my uh, God. Yeah. 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 For all these years, I thought I was, separating myself by marrying Jack. And really, I was just like living out hurt, like doing uh, it. To oh my God. <laughs> I totally get that. I totally get that. Yeah. And I'm, I actually, I think it's really valuable that we should do another interview and talk more about this because I think that the relationship component is it's, there's more, more detail that I think we can go into in part, even in sharing both of our stories, because I, you know, have, Basically, I mean, Shri and I were not married when we broke up, but we broke up and it was a very similar um, dynamic that I was moving through. Yeah. 
And on the other side, we, we got back together. We got married after we got back together. We're, we're working together now. We have such a deep partnership now as a result of being willing to let the relationship go. Yeah. We could not be where we are now without having done that. And frankly, I don't think we could be where we are now without being willing to do it now. Again, like, every day. Again. At yeah. some point in the future, it may become clear that we are no longer moving in the same direction. We don't want the same things. We're no longer in service to the vision that's flowing through us. And we are both really clear that if that time comes, we're choosing the vision. Yeah. Because anything else is such a compromise. It's just like, well, there's nothing for us there. Well, you can't be secure without that. Like if you say, I am, I am going to choose you even if our visions are doing this. Hmm. That, you're making that statement based on insecurity. Hmm. Like, instead of basing it on love. Hmm. Powerful. Because, right? Because love says, baby, thrive. Go. Do your thing. I yeah. love you. I love you so much. I am willing to have you do what you want, not keep you trapped and handcuffed you because I'm insecure about being alone in this world. Yes. Right? Amira, I fucking love you. That was beautiful. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. I yeah. love you. Woo. All right. So for much, much, much more of this, immediately go to the Unstoppable Woman podcast. I, I've listened. It's so good, Amira. I'm so glad that you're doing a podcast. Can I give the URL? Yes, please. Okay, I'm going to give two URLs. The um, podcast is unstoppablewoman.com slash listen. Easy to remember. Unstoppablewoman.com slash listen. And then if you want all sorts of good free resources. We have a ton of stuff at the unstoppablewoman.com slash free stuff. So yes. Yeah. And we have all sorts of like business building mindset stuff, money breakthrough stuff, all that good, good, juicy manifestation. Um, yeah. The thing is, my feeling is that everyone that's here, uh, this is true in general, but especially with you, Amira, like if someone's drawn to you in this conversation, they just need to reach out. They, they need to go deeper. Like tr trust your impulse, those of you listening. If you feel the, and watching, if you feel the, the, the like rising curiosity, that's the indication that there's more for you here. Go, go talk to Amira, get yourself, like do the research, show her that you can figure out how to get on her calendar. <laughs> I love it. I love yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> That hard to you know there's a button <laughs> <laughs> you know, i love it that way, right I love yeah, it. that was a beautiful that was a beautiful thing to say jesse i really mm -hmm. that. Yeah. yeah 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 because because th there's nothing more true there's nothing more true than that kind of that just that what you were talking about before uh, the image of like being called forward toward your vision um it's, it's, it, that's the most important thing for anyone that's listening to either of us to do. So beautiful. Double the power, double the fun. Stay tuned for the next one. <laughs> Amira, thank you so much. I love you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being so generous with your time and your truth and your energy. Thank you for doing all the work that you've done on yourself so that you could have a conversation like this with me. I am so grateful to have you in my life. I love you, Jesse Johnson. Those of you listening, thanks for being here. Comment, question, let us know what lands. I read all the comments. And if there's any specific questions for Amira, I'll make sure that she gets her eyes on them. So let us know what you think. Be well, be happy, be joyful. Everything you want already.